Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, what's coming up on the show today? Jim, today we're going to talk about Patriot Battery Metals and PJX Resources, two of our favorites. Why did Patriot Battery Metals rename its Corvette Lithium Project to Shaquicha U19? Yes, Jim, uh, everybody is having difficulties pronouncing the new name. They, they changed, battery, Patriot Battery Metals uh, changed the name from Corvette ahead of, uh, uh, they did it on July 31st, ahead of the PEA that they published on August 21st. Now, the PEA marks a major shift from expiration, finding the limits of the CV5 deposits, and now they know how they are going to develop. Now the project shifts into the whole permitting cycle and feasibility study, and they predict that they will have the feasibility study done by uh, uh, September of 2025, which is only a year from now, which would be truly impressive if they get this pulled off. Now, in changing the name, they um, are showing respect to the uh, EU Ichu uh, Cree nation that lives in this area. This project is in their backyard. Uh, they have been part of the whole consultation process. In the James Bay region of Quebec, uh, the Cree have uh, not been hostile to development uh, thanks to the uh, development of the hydroelectric reservoir many, many decades ago, which resulted in making sure that the Cree people were not left behind and fail to participate in any of the economic benefits that this created. Now, everybody is mumbling about the name change. Uh, the company did publish a phonetic description of it. So if I do this right, it should be Sha Chi Chi Wa Nan. Now, the problem is the syllables don't mean anything to them. They're not really part of the English words that I that I use, but to the uh, to the Cree, it it all makes perfect sense. It has something to do with uh, 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 climbing climbing a hill or a mountain, and apparently there are three hills nearby. So this is a reference to the to the nearby landmark. And uh, if they had given it a name like a big hill to climb, well, I would remember that in an instant. But I'm going to have a tough time memorizing five obscure syllables. So I'll either continue to call it the Corvette or perhaps simply shorten it to the Jackie Chu deposit. Um, now, the, in all of this, uh, the, uh, the, the significance of the PEA seems to have been lost on the market. And the stock has, uh, has dropped, uh, dropped below $4 since this came out. It's now at the lowest in several, several years, even though this is a world class project. Uh, the company with their uh, PEA news release published a, a, uh, a, a chart showing showing that this is the eighth largest pegmatite deposit in the world in terms of grade and tonnage. So this is definitely a world-class project. However, if you looked carefully at the PEA, you would have maybe chosen a different Cree name, something along the lines of Kapi Kiskwajika Kozi, which according to the rephrasely online translation service means dead in the water. Now, the nameplate uh, uh, numbers that they published show that uh, uh, it has an after-tax NPV of $2.2 billion U.S., which uh, at a 76 uh, exchange rate uh, into, into, into Canadian dollars and 143 million fully diluted shares translates into about $20.50 a share. Um, on top of that, uh, the IRR, after-tax IRR, was 34%. And the CapEx, combining the initial CapEx and the expansion CapEx uh, uh, within, that has to be done within the third year uh, to, to allow them to also simultaneously underground mine the high-grade Nova Zone while they continue the, to open pit mine the, uh, the, the lower-grade part of the deposit, uh, it totaled to $961 million U.S. And, and that excludes the $165 million U.S. Uh, investment tax credit, which they may or may not be, be eligible for. So in terms of uh, development hurdles, such as the uh, NPV exceeding the uh, CapEx and the IRR exceeding uh, 15%, this project clearly passes all these hurdles. It should have a big green light. So why is the stock sinking below $4 and the market despairing about the best 
you know, lithium deposit in North America. Well, the problem is that the base case they use is $1,500 per ton for spodumene concentrate uh, of, with 6% uh, lithium dioxide. Now, uh, the problem with that is that the spot price is $785 per ton, uh, about j just over half the base case price. And this is way below the nearly $6,000 per ton it touched in 2022. Now, that price was never sustainable in the long term because there are way too many pegmatite deposits that are in the money at that price. So you knew this was never going to, uh, going to last. But the market, being what it is, it loves the optics of an obscenely high price and refuses to uh, accept that this price has to come down. It's not real. And of course, when it started coming down last year, the market's enthusiasm for the lithium sector began began to fade. Now, the, the the problem is that at eight, they included a chart in their in their in their news uh, in their news release for the PEA, which showed that at eight hundred dollars a ton, the NPV is a negative one hundred and sixty five million dollars US. In other words, the deposit is worthless at the spot lithium price of today. And uh, that's why I said, well, maybe they should have named it uh, Kapi Kisquachikikosi, or Dead in the Water, instead of uh, Shaji Chi Wanan, or, or Jackie Chu for, for short. Um, so this is a conundrum in the market right now. Uh, when you look at the eight largest uh, pegmatite deposits in the world, only green bushes is in money, and only barely so. The best pegmatite deposits aren't worth mining right now. And yet, when you look at the IEA projections of what is needed by the 2030s uh, for uh, you know EVs to be part of the uh, energy transition goals, we're looking at a five to ten times uh, expansion of supply from the 185 million or so, 185,000 tons of lithium metal equivalent produced last year. Now, the value at the average price last year of $17 a pound lithium carbonate was about uh, uh, 30, $36 uh, billion, $37 billion. Uh, if you use a more reasonable price, like $10 a pound lithium, lithium carbonate uh, equivalent, uh, that works out to about $20 billion. Uh, but that itself, way above the uh, $200 million it was worth in 2005, and six, f already four to five times more than it was in 2015. So we are dealing with a metal that's doing something unprecedented in history. Thanks to a new technology, which is the lithium-ion battery scaled up to be used in cars rather than just in laptops, uh, We and, and the... Uh, energy transition goals, which are driven by policy, basically an existential necessity to keep uh, global warming from continuing and making the planet inhospitable for humans, uh, maybe not for other creatures, but certainly for, for a population the size of the world, world today. Uh, th this is a, um, a critical part of this. And, um, but at the current price, all the pegmatite supply is going to just disappear. So we have this strange thing here, a spot price, which is similar to what happened in the lithium winter that began in, uh, in 2018, when development of the lithium supply overshot the EV transition. And then in 2021, the EVs caught up and overshot the supply from the system. It's this thing like a car that keeps starting and stopping. And we are now in one of these stopping modes where the, the, the market is pounding out these, these companies. Uh, they're using base case prices that are at a realistic level where you can imagine that you're going to see uh, five to ten times a, a future supply by 2030 to make all the EV replacement of ICE cars, ICE cars reality. But the market does not think in long-term prices. It doesn't think about what's needed. It just looks at what is. So for for bottom fishers, this is going to be a great period coming up. It's going to be miserable for existing shareholders. I do not think it's time yet to start uh, bottom fishing because there's a, a number of reasons why the market has turned so negative towards uh, lithium in the electric vehicle situation. Now, one reason 
that people don't care that uh, uh, we're never going to build uh, the, uh, the the Jackie Chu mine uh, is that uh, well, there's direct lithium extraction applied to brine field or oil field brines, where which have very low lithium grade in it. And groups like Exxon are doing R and D, and if they can get it to work at a price, at say the current unit price. It would not be a, a spotty mean concentrate, but it would be the lithium carbon equivalent, and, and it's now 475 a pound, so that's roughly in line with what the spotty mean concentrate trade is. Uh, if they could produce it and scale it up unlimited to the uh, required level, well, then you will not need any pegmatite mines in the future. So right now, people are inclined to think in this half glass, half empty mode, uh, well, there'll be other sources of lithium if we require if we require the lithium. Now, another reason is that the EV re evolution revolution that accelerated in 2021, it has effectively stalled everywhere in the world but China. The cars that the western car makers developed are too expensive to be good enough for the mass market. The mass market has range anxiety. It wants these cars to charge quickly and it wants them to be cheap. What the Western car makers have is not cheap and it doesn't have the, the, the range and charge times that the, um, that the mass market really wants. So it's kind of a non-starter. The Chinese electric vehicles are cheap and they do not have the range and charge times that the public wants, but they're cheap enough to be good enough. But now Canada, the United States, Europe is erecting uh, uh, import tariffs to prevent a flood of cheap Chinese good enough electric vehicles from coming into their domestic markets and killing the domestic car makers. So now the car makers, the Western car makers are all suspending their expansion plans. Uh, they, they, even Volvo has said, okay, we're no longer going to be ice free in by 2030, yes, it, it, it's not happening. Now, the one company that actually understood how this was going to play out was Toyota, and they were trashed for a long time because they did not embrace the EV, the EV revolution. They did play with hydrogen fuel cell technology, but that was also a hopeless chicken and egg, egg problem. But what they did do was invest money on solid state lithium ion battery R&D. We need this technology breakthrough of a solid state lithium ion battery. And that's what makes the future requirements go from five times more than what it was in, uh, in, in 2023 to 10 times more. Because if you have a solid state battery, you can use lithium in the anode and then you get the very long range and you get the short charge times that the public public wants. Now, Toyota's indicated that maybe they'll have an elite model available by 2028, and maybe by 2030, they'll have Camrys and Corollas. And the market's saying, well, that's a long time away. Now, this shouldn't really matter for projects like uh, like Jackie Chu, because uh, it uh, it will take that long to get it into production, to get it permitted and and built. But the market doesn't want to think in these sorts, these sorts of timelines. Now, um, uh, what what could uh, possibly uh, uh, change in all this? Oh, oh, there's another another reason that uh, the market's so negative. Uh, CATL, which is the world's biggest battery maker, it's a Chinese company. It keeps talking about how lithium-ion battery technology is obsolete. Uh, it's going to be replaced by something they're working on involving sodium. Uh, lithium is still basic for physics and chemistry. The best battery material out there. But, you know, if, if worst comes to worst, uh, they can maybe have a good enough sodium-based battery. So, so everybody's thinking, well, if that gets invented, who needs future pegmatite mines? So, so that's also uh, keeping people back. Another major factor is, um, in addition to like the car companies basically suspending everything for several years while they see what happens, another is the upcoming election. Uh, the, Trump has pretty much uh, said that you know, climate change, all of its BS, uh, the energy transition is BS. Not only will I roll back everything that the Biden administration done to encourage the energy transition, we will even erect obstacles to make it difficult for clean energy technologies and measures to take effect. And given the structure of the Electoral College, even though the minority of Americans will vote for Trump, it is quite conceivable that there will be a Trump presidency next year. 
So there's this uncertainty hanging over the market too that uh, when this happens, well, then we'll just give up on the uh, on the whole climate change thing, uh, settle down into an end times mentality. And for those who are are religious, well, they can pray for divine intervention. Uh, that's that's an activity that can never be proven wrong because, of course, it will never be proven proven right. So it's always can happen tomorrow. And we just settled into like accepting that things are going to unfold as they are currently unfolding. Now, another thing is that uh, uh, the geopolitical conflict between global West and East it has the potential to escalate and turn hot. If it does, and it's China and Russia squared off against uh, the global West, and, and if Trump is uh, in charge, it's, uh, you know, America against everybody else, uh, uh, we're going to have global trade will collapse. We're going to have raw material supply problems like you can't believe. And even stuff that's made in all different parts of the world, all of a sudden, it may not be able to be shipped along the shipping lines to, to the target market. So there's going to be a mess. And Nobody is going to worry about about climate change, and uh, it's going to be the least of our concerns. So we're heading into this type of window uh, that uh, uh, we may simply not care about energy transition goals because we have worse things, worse things to worry about. Um, so these are all these negative things hanging over the market, but they do they are not necessary things. Um, there could it could be possible that. Putin, Trump, G, all disappear into the sunset and take their power-hungry goals with them, and the world gets back to a normality of enjoying life and uh, and and, tra- and trying to make the world more prosperous. It's also possible that Toyota's commercialization efforts could happen a lot faster than they have predicted. So suddenly in the next couple of years, instead of waiting till 2028, we hear that they've really fine-tuned the solid-state lithium-ion battery. Then there's going to be a new urgency in making this possible. And and groups like Honda and Nissan are also working on that. And I'm sure all the uh, Western car makers have all gone back to the drawing board to think harder about making a battery that's going to make the EV good enough for mass market adoption. So, and it's possible that the DLE research finally concludes that our, our unit cost is going to be higher than $800 a, a ton spodumene concentrate equivalent, and it may not scale to that five to ten times demand expansion that uh, the IEA is predicting, especially if solid-state lithium-ion batteries make that the battery of the EVs of the future. So this this could all uh, all um, unfold, you know, in, in the next three to six months, not before the end of 2024. So we're going to be stuck with a slump in the uh, lithium sector and Patriot battery metals. Uh, uh, assuming they don't get swallowed by some stink bid by somebody, uh, say Gina Reinhardt uh, comes along and says, well, I way overpaid for these other things like Azure. Now I can buy this at a fraction of the cost. And because we're still in this period of uncertainty about whether there will be an EV lithium ion battery powered future, that company may disappear at a modest markup from current price level. What's the latest development for PGX Resources and its Sullivan 2 hunt? Well, the sad news is that on Tuesday, Bob Termundi, a keen Sullivan 2 hunter, passed away at the age of uh, 94. He and his son Tim were founders of Eagle Plains Resources in 1999 as a prospect generator that survives today without any rollback plus a number of spin-outs. So this has been a very successful junior. And I first met Bob and Bob, Bob and Tim way back then in, in 2000 and got to know them and I have really enjoyed uh, chatting with Bob over the years. And I, uh, I, I called him, I, I called him up, uh, uh, last week, uh, you know, because, uh, PJX had announced on July 8th that, uh, it had received uh, all the permits to finally let it get start drilling at the Dudney Trail, Dudney Trail project in southeastern British Columbia. And, uh, Bob, of course, is connected with all these, uh, ex Cominco people, uh, Dave Pegan, uh, Paul Ransom, uh, Troy, Troy, Troy Higg, uh, um, and, and, uh, and he, uh, and everybody is watching this play because it is something very, 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 
very interesting. Now, for those out there who do not know anything about Sullivan, it was a 161 million ton deposit found in 1896, which finally ran out of ore in 2001, and it was mainly an underground underground mine. And the whole area has been reclaimed, and it is now a a museum that's really fun to, to, to visit, go underground and watch how stuff was done over the hundred years that it, it was mined. Now, uh, it, it, the Sullivan deposit, it's, it's large and it's called a SEDEX deposit, sedimentary exhalative, which means that there was a vent on the ocean floor that spewed fluids full of sulfides, iron sulfides, zinc sulfides, uh, lead sulfides, smaller amounts of copper sulfides, which all ended up like a big smoker system uh, blowing into the into the water and then depending on the current, slowly settling down, precipitating on the floor and building up these beds that radiate away, but often in the middle on top of the vent, uh, a big mound. And in the case of the Sullivan deposit, uh, this thing was several kilometers wide and it was a hundred meters thick of uh, rich, uh, you know, 10, 10 to 15 percent uh, combined lead zinc mineralization plus a significant silver kicker plus a whole bunch of other metals such such as tin. And uh, and because these occur in clusters, uh, everybody for the past hundred years has been looking for more of them, but they've largely failed to have any success. They found either a vein type systems such as the, the nearby stem winder or small puddles such as the fours which uh, never really evolved into large into large deposits and of course uh, the, the 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 contact between the lower and middle aldrich formations uh, is the area sort of where sullivan took occurred and they've been looking for any outcrop like that that exists and 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 so that whole part of southeastern BC where this stratigraphy outcrops, it's been crawled over and banged with hammers and tested and sampled, and pretty much nothing resembling Sullivan II has been found. So in past decades, the hunt for Sullivan II shifted to deeper targets where you basically geochemically blind, uh, uh, but using geophysical techniques and then using reconstruction of what you're um, encountering to see if you're in one of these sub basins where this would have deposit would have evolved to try and vector in on a deep blind deposit. And there's been a you know a number of attempts like that in, in recent years. Uh, Highway 50 attempted it at Monroe uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in in 29 in 2018. The PGX itself with the Vine. Project the vine itself is a vein type system, but they in 2019 drill deep holes to chase a geophysical geophysical anomaly, and uh, and then of course Eagle Plains itself last year drilled the Vulcan target uh, where uh, Kaminko have ages ago seen sort of thin thin edges of what might have been something, uh, but it never really hung together, and uh, again they, they drill deep holes and ultimately nobody has ever found anything. So when in October of last year, PJX published a news release with photos of these boulders their prospectors had found at the base of a uh, mountain slope in the Talus, uh, not far from the uh, former Estrella mine, which is one of these discordant vein type systems with, with a massive sulfide zinc lead, but no, no real tonnage potential. This rock sawed in half Showed the classic fragmental textures with, you know, high grade zinc, zinc, zinc lead mineralization that you see in a true seafloor vented deposit. And everybody and all the ex Cominco guys, uh, they all, they all freak, freaked out when they said, where on earth did you find this? I mean, something like this cannot be outcropping. And it turns out to have been a bit of a serendipity thing because this mountain slope uh, the upper half of it is uh, Middle Aldridge Formation Stratigraphy, and it's pretty much tombstone. It dips 40 degrees to the to the east. But the lower face of it, uh, PGX was exploring it because it was a much younger, 160 million and younger age igneous intrusion, a, a cyanite of some sort, which they hope might have some sort of porphyry gold copper copper potential, and uh, and. Uh, and so they were at the base of this slope, and that's where they found these boulders that didn't belong there. And when they did further investigation, they realized that this wasn't a real copper gold economic target because it was, in fact, a dike that had come up 
perpendicular to the stratigraphy and somehow had been preserved on the lower half of this mountain, shielding, pretty much shielding like a curtain, that part of the stratigraphy where a Sullivan type of deposit might have formed and would otherwise be outcropping. And obviously some small erosional windows have eroded in this dike sheet and the boulders have spilled out and ended up with all the other garbage rock in the, in the talus at the base. The company had not been able to find where these holes are, so they do not know exactly where the horizon is that a, uh, this massive sulfide zinc lead rich mineralization formed. They did find off to the north a, a, at a higher level, they found some zinc lead mineralization, but it did not have the magnetic qualities of the boulders at the base, so they felt this was this was peripheral. And sometime after July 8th, the company started drilling, and they didn't put out a news release. And uh, when I asked Bob, uh, well, your, your, your network of uh, uh, Sullivan II hunters, have they heard anything? And he said, no, it, it's silence, just silence. And, and this type of thing where you know, you, you think you know where it is, where you set up a drill rig and you set up a sniper shot. Uh, uh, no news is not good news. So on the weekend, Bob got into his truck, drove out to the base of the valley and uh, scanned the mountain with his telescope and figured out where the platform was and took some pictures and shared them with us in our, in our Slack forum. And uh, so we knew they were drilling. And then he passed away on Tuesday and on Thursday, PJX puts out a news release, and uh, uh, it finally admitted they drilled. They drilled three holes. The first two appear to have been dusters. The third hole is 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 um, 20 meters of true width of sulfide mineralization, mainly pyrotite and pyrite, with traces of chalcopyrite and sphalerite. But it has all the fragmental textures, and it was at the bottom of a 275-meter hole. This is not a discovery hole uh, because you want the zinc-lead mineralization. And they do not know what the geometry is of this uh, target area. They do not know where exactly the, the mineralized horizon is. Uh, in the Sullivan deposit itself, the lower part, uh, the pancake, it's actually just pyrotype without any any zinc lead in it. So they could be into something like that. But they've got the first vector hole into the system to begin understanding. And, and I ask, well, you know, why didn't you just park the drill rig right on top of above where the, uh, the dike sheet ends and just drill down there? And it turns out that this physically was not possible because it is a fairly steep mountain slope. And, uh, and so they had to set up near the peripheral target. And the peripheral target seems to be like slumped blocks that have moved around so that they don't, they don't really hang together. But they now have the beginning of a vectoring strategy. The next hole will be key because it'll help them triangulate which direction does this all dip? What's, what's all going on? Where do we need to set up the next round of hills? And, and John Keating's talked about uh, getting a second rig onto the property so that they can start figuring this out. But the stock, which had been around 20 cents, uh, it sold off down to a 15 cents, 1.3 million shares. Part of the problem was shareholders who had been hoping for instant gratification, suddenly thinking, oh, it's complicated. The glass has gone from half full to half empty. I'm out of here. But we also still have this uh, 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 flow-through problem. Uh, apparently, there were three funds that bought about 8 million units, uh, 10 cents with a um, 20, cent, uh, 20 cent warrant. Uh, one of those funds apparently blew out all their stock earlier this year when the stock was 30 cents. Uh, the other ones are still sitting on to some degree, but nobody knows and they don't tell anybody. And what happens with these flow-through funds is they get rolled into a mutual fund, which then the, the unit holders who put up the flow-through money and got the 150% right off, they can ask to redeem it. So the, company, so the managers are constantly just selling stock to raise cash for redemptions. And of course, it's been a horrible year, second horrible year for Resource Junior. So any, any flow-through and fund investor with half a brain would be busy getting their instructions in before everything goes to zero and they get absolutely nothing back from, from their initial initial investment. And of course, upcoming is the uh, next flow through season where you do it in November, December, and you like to do it in, in the 
just before the end of the year because when you sell in the following year, the tax consequences, you know, your cost base is zero. So whatever you get is subject to capital gains. That gets then rolled over, you know, into, into the subsequent year. Whereas if you do it, say, this spring and, and you sell it this year, this next April, you're going to have to have to pay, pay the tax. But one of the peculiar things about this is the warrants. They stay in the fund. They can't be issued to the shareholder. And if they're worth something, which in this case they're not, um, they, they have to be exercised as the person redeems. But once they redeem with the warrants worthless, they accumulate within this fund. So a peculiar thing is happening here where all the fund holders are redeeming their stock, all the long positions are blown out, but the warrants are accumulating. Now, most of the companies are going to be junk in there and they're never, the warrants are never going to be worthwhile. But it could be that if there's one diehard who stays long, this flow-through fund ends up uh, having 2 million warrants exercisable at 20 cents to his or her credit that don't expire for at least another year. And the beauty of PJX is that this is a world-class target. Mother Nature is cruel, may not deliver, but the setting is there, the, ana the analog is there, they're starting to sort out where it is. Will it scale big? We don't know. That's discovery expiration. That's why the stock's 15, 17 cents today. But this continues to be a very exciting story. And uh, I thank Bob Tremundi for making that trip out there to spy on it. Good old fashioned uh, uh, discovery play research. Uh, nowadays, you just call the phone or do whatever. Going out into the field and spying to see what's happening. That's the old way it used to be done. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.